Um, I am happy to have you uh, in this today's session, uh, Dr. Engineer Arora and Sandar Raja. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice uh, introduction, uh, Chairman and Subaha. Let me load up my presentation slides into Zoom. Hope you can see my uh, presentation slide mode. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening all. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for taking the effort uh, and time to attend this uh, virtual session uh, today during these uh, difficult times. It is indeed uh, a great uh, privilege uh, to share the knowledge and experiences that I gained over the past eight years in geotechnical and road payment engineering uh, with my home country engineers and uh, practitioners. So next, uh, let me introduce our research entity, Spark Hub. Spark stands for uh, Simart Payments, Australia Research collaboration. And it is the first uh, university-led research platform for the transport payment sector in Australia. Spark is primarily funded by the Australian Research Council, and it was established in 2019. So as you see here, our vision is to transform the Australian payment industry to make payments smarter, longer lasting, safer and more economical with the lower environmental footprint. So we have over uh, seven um, collaborative universities. Monash University is the lead university in which the spark up main operations take place. And we have over 42 exciting and cutting edge research projects in the transport research tech sector, which is primarily managed by research scholars or PhD scholars and uh, research engineers. So we are located in Victoria. So Australia uh, has uh, six states and uh, two territories. We are in the south part or the bottom of Australia, Victoria state, Melbourne city. From the Melbourne city, we are about 30 kilometers down southwards and uh, Monash University is very close to us. So Spark Up headquarters is about 500 meters away from Monash University premises. So if you want to hear more about Spark Hub and our research activities and upcoming workshops and so on, please visit our website. Also feel free to subscribe to our newsletter, which brings all the exciting uh, research outcomes uh, in a monthly basis. So over the last uh, two years, we have appointed over 12 top bright talents from Sri Lanka to the Spark Up across seven local universities who have been working on exciting research projects in the transport infrastructure to resolve pressing problems. Monash is the lead university, so majority of the PhD scholars are located at Monash University. We expect to have more PhD opportunities down the track. Therefore, please send us your expression of interest, EOI, if you are interested in pursuing a PhD as your next career in Australia. So following my presentation, as uh, Subaha indicated, one of our PhD scholars, Mr. Sudhagaran, uh, will be presenting on intelligent compaction for ASPOL payments. So Sudha has been working with me very closely on this topic. 
So let's now turn into the main topic of today's talk. I will walk you through various aspects of road payment engineering, including testing, design, and construction. So you can send your questions by typing in the slide number and question in the chat box. We will have a short break halfway through my presentation, and I will cover the questions during the break. And I would greatly appreciate it if you can kindly mute yourself during the presentation. So a strong road transport network, as we all know, which underpins the social, economic, and cultural uh, fabric of a nation. So roads, in particular in Australia, largest public-owned infrastructure. And Australia spends about 20 billion annually on roads, which includes the maintenance and construction of new roads. And it casts over 900,000 kilometers of road network. We are facing a challenging period of increased road deterioration with increased traffic loads and volumes. So as you see on the right hand side of your uh, right hand side figure, uh, it is a highway, basically a freeway in China. Imagine how many lanes are on this road. So it's over 40. And imagine if any of these lanes fail or if any of these lanes require frequent maintenance, how much traffic disruption or traffic delays that going to cost. So it clearly substantiates the good quality road network in particular in developed countries for the nation's growth. And the recent article from um, <coughs> Professor Chung Hang has indicated that road payments are among the most poorly understood uh, structure among other various type of structures in civil engineering field. So typical uh, structure of a payment, flexible payment in particular, it functions basically bottom up, bottom up approach, where the subgrade, let me get my laser point. We are a subgrade here, which is a natural ground, is supports the subbase and base. So subbase can be any weak rock or crash rock. Normally, subbase is not required if the weather conditions and the climate is uh, reasonably good in the area the payment is constructed. So subbase is an optional element of the payment primarily subgrade, which is a natural ground, and then the base. The base, which can made up of asphalt, different type of payment materials, crush rock, and recycled materials. So we'll be covering that in the future, in the upcoming slides. So base is the primary element of the payment structure, which attunates the majority or most of the stresses coming from the traffic load. And the last thin part or the, or the small uh, surface of the payment is the uh, wearing hose, which provides the right quality or riding quality and the permeable, impermeable uh, boundary conditions or conditions for the payments. The primary enemy of the payment or road structure is water, the seal or the top surface or the thin bitumen surface is absolutely critical element of the payment in terms of the functional aspects of the payment. So a typical cross section of the real road surface is given here. Uh, the top part, which is a surface with the bitumen, I would say as pole, it looks like an uh, overlay. And then you have a 100 or 150 millimeter as pole layer, and then a base layer with cement treated or crushed rock and followed by the subgrade, which seems to be a, a marginal rock. Right? It's a typical profile of the payment structure. 
So how payment function? So why do we need payments? Can't we use the natural ground itself to um, pass these traffics and, and, and vehicles? The issue is subgrade is not, is not enough uh, or subgrade doesn't have enough strength to resist the heavy axial loads coming from the traffic. And traffic is not a static load, it is a dynamic load and it is a repetitive loading. Therefore, it needs to sustain the um, uh, payment life, basically 30 years, 40 years. So how payment functions? Um, a stress analysis here from a finite element modeling uh, shows that when the E1, the base modulus, which is normally resilient modulus, and E2, the sub-base modulus, uh, change in the fashion here, even now E to one to five, and then 100, you can see the vertical stress coming to the subgrade, right? So as even over E2 ratio increases, in other words, as base become more stronger and stronger, the vertical stress coming onto the subgrade, subgrade, remember, is the natural soil or the natural ground is reduces, right? Therefore, subgrade is more protected as base attunates majority of the stress coming from the traffic. So the stress value here, you could ask why 750 kilopascal is marked here. 750 kilopascal is the standard axial load used in the Australian payment design. I will discuss that in the following upcoming slides. So what are the basic payment types? typically um, uh, found or used in the construction industry. So flexible payments. So under flexible payments, we have a range of um, categories in the material type. So crash rock, which is uh, basically 90% in Australia, 90% per, 90 of the roads in Australia has unbound crash rock which has certain gradation, which means it has both crush rock or the grass aggregates and the fines to meet the grading requirements in such that the compaction can be achieved. And then asphalt, which is also flexible payment. And then in between, we have semi-bound payments, which can be sometimes considered as rigid payments, depend upon the amount of cement or binder you use. So semi-bound payments, uh, in Australia, cement-treated bases or CTBs is uh, uh, used in, in areas where we need uh, uh, rehabilitation for maintaining large amount of traffic. So if you use higher amount of cement, which is still not considered as a concrete, however, it can still fall into the rigid payments. And the last category is the bound payment, which is concrete. Concrete also has different categories, uh, fiber reinforced concrete and uh, reinforced concrete and so on. So Australia is gradually moving towards concrete payments, in particular in Sydney, due to the uh, heavy axial load, uh, loads coming from traffic, because Australia is now under pressure due to the freight movement. So, Freight movements by roads has been tripled over the last uh, 15 years. Therefore, they need to maintain good quality payments for the effective uh, product and so on. So bound payments in particular concrete payments are uh, becoming more popular in Australia. The last category is the composite payments, which is mainly in the uh, rehabilitation, uh, road payment rehabilitation area, where the asphalt overlay is being constructed uh, for temporary uh, operational purposes. So payment response uh, to the traffic loads uh, in terms of stress and strain for both flexible payments and rigid payments, this picture uh, depicts the typical boundary conditions. Uh, if, you, if, you, uh, cross if you consider the payment section where the wheel load is applied, the flexible payments, which try to resist a traffic load, which is a compressive load at the top, by this 
uh, by this uh, tensile strain at the bottom. That means the base is bending in order to resist the traffic load coming at the, at the surface. And you see the compression force or compression stress and the strain at the top and the tensile at the bottom. This boundary or this uh, observation is only in asphalt pavements and uh, I would say cement treated basal, but not in the UGM. Although UGM or the crust rock unbound granular pavements is classified as flexible pavements, it responds is not bending. So it is uh, in their layer um, uh, taking the load and the compression is encountered uh, across the layer. So remember the A, the flexible pavements. If I go back to my previous slide, this unbound payments, I'm referring to the crust rock, is not uh, is not experienced in the stress strain diagram I have shown here in figure number A. So figure number A is always applicable to asphalt and the cement treated base. So unbound layer, if you look at the unbound layer stress distribution, it's going to be all the way down compressive, right? And bottom, it may get tense and depending on the layer thickness. And the concrete payment, as you know, so it's going to resist a lot uh, in compression as shown in figure number B. So the critical location in payment structure. So as we are engineers, so we want to design the payment such that the payment long lasts for the design period, which typically 30 to 50 years in Australia uh, for, for major arterial roads connecting cities like Sydney and Melbourne, over 900,000 kilometers. So typical design life ranges between 30 to 50 years. So we've got to make sure that the payment doesn't fail or doesn't require the frequent maintenance uh, during the design life. So what are the critical locations in the payment structure for the design perspective? So if you look at the asphalt layer, as I have highlighted earlier, asphalt bends uh, to resist a heavy traffic loading. So in that sense, the typical uh, location here, right, at the, right below the standard axial. So standard axial in the payment design is considered as dual axial as shown in this figure, carrying an axial load of 80 kilonewton. So 80 kilonewton stress on the axial, which is the part of the heavy axial, is transmuting 80 kilonewton in other words, 750 kilopascal, as I mentioned earlier, on the payment surface. This is the standard axial used in the payment design in Australia. So what would be the contact stress at this point? If they use a standard tire, which is 300 millimeter bit, then that would induce a contact stress of 92.1 millimeter. It depends on the tire's stage and the condition as well. However, normally in the payment design, we assume 92.1 millimeter. So if the load is applied in that manner, so what would be the critical location in the asphalt layer as it tends to bend? So the critical location as marked here, the horizontal tensile strain at the bottom of the asphalt. When it's come to the granular base, unfortunately so far, we don't have any performance criteria for granular base in terms of stress and strain. So primarily failure mechanism is rutting, we will be covering that in the in the uh, future presentation slides. So granular base, there is no particular location at which the payment fails. So there's no critical location in other words in the granular base, the entire base is subjected to the compression. Depend on the payment layer thickness, the bottom can go to tension. Then when it's got to the cement treated base, which is very similar to asphalt, the stresses uh, or the critical locations here would be um, as similar to the asphalt, right below the standard axial, where you see horizontal tensile strain uh, due to the bending that creates the uh, uh, significant or maximum strain at the bottom of the base. Then the last layer, which is a natural subgrade of the soil, uh, vertical stress or vertical strain acting on the subgrade creates the rutting, in other words. Therefore, the critical location for the subgrade is considered as the top part right below the wheel. You see the maximum compressive strain. So as you go down below, which you may reach the um, rock, but the strain with the depth is going to decrease. Therefore, the top subgrade experiences the highest strain. 
So with the time, if this load is repeatedly applied, what would happen is the subgrade start to deform permanently. That is called rotting. Right? So if you look at the moving traffic load, so so far in the previous slide, what I have shown is a static load. Yeah, the static pressure is applied on the pavement. So now the vehicle is moving with, uh, uh, with certain speed. So what would happen to the pavement um, stress? Right. So, so imagine there is a wheel here. This is a pavement surface right at the top. So what would happen to the stress if the wheel is moving? So right below the wheel, right, if you look at the stress strain conditions here, so this plane will act as a principal stress. That means sigma one and sigma three are the principal stress directions and they are stress components here you mark. So shear stress will be maximum. So right below the wheel, what would happen? The shear stress will become zero at that point, whereas the vertical stress and the horizontal stresses will change in this fashion. So this is the principal stress uh, direction when the vehicle is right or the wheel is right below the right above the point. So what would happen if this wheel moves away? Right? So that indicates here. So that this principal stress direction will gradually change as vehicle moves. Right? So if the vehicle moves from this side, that means my left hand side to right hand side, as you see the principal stress direction, it rotates clockwise. Principal stress values are calculated basically using the mechanistic design approach, which is uh, in Australia, circular software. And um, these values are used in the payment design. And a typical change of stress strain, so right below the wheel is shown here. So the CSS is goes to negative and it becomes zero right at the right below the wheel, and then it goes to positive. And uh, vertical stress, horizontal stress, vertical stress normally here, sigma one, one. So don't confuse with the geomechanics. So here we, in the payment, vertical stress here is sigma one, one. And the horizontal stresses here, sigma two, two, and sigma three, three for the mark here. And in the real payment, the stresses or the strains are measured with the distribu distributed fiber optic sensors and the various other sensors, including the earth pressure shell. And the typical values are marked here for subgrade in an unbound granular payment. This is a real measurement in the field when the vehicle moves. So you see the time here. So the vehicle movement is captured with time, right? So time versus stress or strain here indicates the vehicle moves in certain speed in a certain direction. So what happens to the strain here at this location, Z equal to 533. That means from the surface, we are measuring the strain at a depth of 533 millimeter, it's about a, a half a meter. And the applied load is about 80 kilonewton, and the surface contact stress, estimated stress is about 690 kilopascal, right? So the vertical strain with the time changes like this. So as you, as you, as you saw on your right-hand side, or oh, sorry, left-hand side here, the vertical stress here, here strain is captured. Remember the sign conventions are different because they are from different papers or different, different uh, uh, technical reports. So they are using different sign convention, but the magnitude wise, you see the same pattern. This is a, from numerical modeling, this is from the real experiment. But one interesting thing to notice here is the longitudinal strain, which is important for the bending, the asphalt and cement treated space. So what happened to the longitudinal strain uh, and the transfer strain, E, Y, Y, and E, e Y, Y, basically Y is the travel direction, which is in terms, in other words, longitudinal direction. And transverse direction is a perpendicular to travel direction, in the X direction. So you see the strain values is uh, in the longitudinal direction is higher than the value in the transverse direction. That means the strain that is experienced by the payment in the vehicle movement direction, in the horizontal direction is higher than the strain that is experienced by the payment in the transverse direction. So this is important when it's come to the 
payment fatigue analysis or payment design. So transverse direction experiences the higher strain. So remember this one, this will be useful in the, in the, in the future fatigue analysis upcoming slides. So now we understood the basic uh, payment response and the payment uh, structure and so on. So now what is our task as engineers? We need to further understand the performance characteristics of the road payment materials under different situations. The road payments are not like buildings. So they go for like kilometers and kilometers over kilometers, thousand, nine hundred thousand, things like that. So it exposed to various climates, including moisture change, temperature change, and different type of traffic loads. So our task is to give the community economically built and maintain and road payment success so that the nation can grow. So before we step into the detail part of the payments, I'd like to give you the overarching view of the payment and its elements in terms of engineering point of view. So starting from the material, right? So we first select the material for payment design or construction. So material can be different asphalt, cement treated, crushed rock and so on. So once we select the material, it can be a new material. For example, plastic, plastic um, uh, recycled material uh, mixed with asphalt, right? Once you selected the material, you cannot directly use it in the construction. So what is our next step? Basically, you need to test and characterize its engineering properties and the relevant properties for the road performance, right? So I will, I will walk you through different aspects of the uh, testing and characterization in the laboratory. So as soon as we understand the material properties and its behavior. And the next step is we create a performance criteria. So if we construct this payment using this material, what would be the failure mechanism under traffic or under repeated load? So we study that performance and then we design for the performance. All right, when it's come to the design, we normally, undertake the traffic analysis using traffic spe spectrums predicted for the new road construction or forecasted for the current road. And then using the traffic analysis and the performance criteria we developed for the material, then we design it in the software using the mechanistic design approach or empirical approach for existing payment materials such as crash rock. So traffic analysis is a big chapter because traffic consists of different axial groups and different heavy vehicles with the different axial loads. So I will not cover that part, but we have reasonable citations or references to look at. So I will share that with you at the end of the presentation. And as soon as we design the payment for the forecasted traffic with the predicted performance, and the next step is construction, construction as per the design, layer thickness, target density, and so on. So at the end of the payment construction, the quality control and quality assurance, which is a critical element of the payment construction, and it is a compulsory requirement in Australia to meet the certain quality control, quality assurance uh, requirements. So quality control requirements for it varies with the material. If it is a granular material, it would be density and moisture content with different experimental or different uh, non-destructive methods in the field to measure them, right? And after the quality control, there is a common and the traditional method called proof rolling, which is very subjective. It's commonly done before they open the road for trafficking. So the purpose of the proof rolling is to understand the payment has reached enough strength for trafficking. I'll cover that in a separate slide. 
And once the pavement is open to traffic, then the regular maintenance, the surface ceiling need to be patched. There may be potholes, and you know heavy vehicle brakes can create a shear failure. Things like that. Regular maintenance, but it's 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 done in Australia every one year. Sometimes the period can be longer if the payment quality is good. But as uh, road authorities recommend, uh, the contractor must do the regular maintenance as per the specification. Then after a certain number of years, right, we normally do the condition assessment of the payment or the road. Condition assessment is to understand the current functional and structural characteristics of the road payment. So functional characteristics include the rutting profile and the surface texture and the right quality, riding quality of the surface. The structural characteristic characteristics include the modulus of the pavement, right? And the strength of the pavement. Right? So this can be assessed with the various state of the art facilities that include GPR, ground penetration radar. Right, ground penetration radar determines the payment thickness non-destructively, as well as it could estimate the asphalt uh, layer density, right, which is uh, emerging research, but uh, is not yet available in the practice. And another tool is uh, uh, to determine the uh, rutting profile is IRI, International Roughness Index, and IRI is a traditional method. And then we have other facilities like laser profilometer, TSD, traffic speed deflectometer, FWD, falling weight deflectometer for the condition assessment, mainly the structural assessment. So as soon as we find the current status of the road payment and its stage, then we undertake the remaining life. How much? Uh, life this payment has before it fails, right? So basically we do the finite element modeling again with the remaining life analyt analytics. And then we say, okay, you will have another 10 years with the forecasted traffic on this payment. Then based on the asset management and the maintaining schedule, also the budget available from the government or the particular state, then they decide um, the, the maintenance schedule. So they have some sort of softwares to do that. And then they decide, should we go for overlay construction or new payment construction, right? So that's an overarching view of the payment. So in the next um, slides, I will be mainly talking about the things that are marked in the red color circle payment construction, maintenance, and so on, condition assessment due to the time limit, I will not touch on them. However, if time uh, comes in the future, I will organize another session for that. Road payment materials. I have listed the commonly available payment materials uh, in Australia and other, other developed countries at present. So crash rock. Uh, like I said earlier, crust rock is commonly referred to as unbound granular materials. And it's found in Australia, over 95 or 90% 90 of the roads, which is 900,000 kilometers, consist of unbound granular materials. And most of them have already reached their design life. So crust rock in Australia commonly classified into four categories, class one, class two, class three, class four, Class one and class two are high quality grass rocks and class three and class four normally marginal materials. And the bitumen and asphalt, asphalt uh, yeah, also uh, in Australia, it's considered in two main ways. One is full depth asphalt payment, which is commonly used for freeways and highways for uh, carrying heavy traffic axial loads. And then it also considered uh, in the seal, uh, asphalt with, uh, unbound layers with thin asphalt seal. And then stabilized unbound granular material. Right? So UGMs can be stabilized with uh, various binders, right? which include cement, slag, and fly ash. And Australia is forefront in using cement stabilized uh, UGMs. 
because their payments have already reached their design life and they are using the institute stabilization of the existing degraded unbound payments to strengthen the payments for the forecasted profit. Commonly GP cement is used and GB also used uh, depending on the urgency of the traffic opening. And the next emerging material is uh, foam bitumen and the bitumen emulsions. Normally these two materials used together with the lime or cement to provide sufficient uh, strength and uh, stiffness or modulus and they are considered to be secondary binder. And there are other sort of binders available as well, uh, polymer, fiber, and hydrophobic liquids. And geosynthetics, they are used in different uh, elements of the payments. SAMI, same alleviating membrane, is used to prevent the reflective cracking of the layers, uh, in particular, very close to the seal. SAMI is used if the bottom layer is cement treated base, because cement treated base can have shrinkage cracking. Therefore, they normally place SAMI, chain alleviated membrane, such that the crack coming from the CTB is not cement treated base, it's not reflected on the surface of the payment because SAMI attenuates the strain or the stress coming through these cracks. And geocrits is also commonly used on soft soil or soft subgrade to strengthen the uh, subgrade before we place the UGM, right? So if the subgrade is too soft, what would happen is you will require a large or thicker payment, which may not be cost effective. So what they normally do is they strengthen the subgrade, which can be by cement stabilizing or lime stabilizing subgrade or placing the geograde so that the soft grade will receive enough strength. And the geotextile, geotextile uh, is commonly used um, to prevent water movement coming from the natural or the groundwater to the subgrade and then subgrade to the base. Then if base receive water under cyclic loading or repeated traffic loading, pumping would happen, finally the payment would fail. So ge geotextile is commonly used for that purpose. And recently, there are various recycled materials uh, emerging in this uh, payment rehabilitation, which includes scram rubber, um, reclaim asphalt payment, RAP. RAP is normally used with uh, secondary binders like uh, cement and so on, and then glass, plastic, and toner. So in Australia, we have several research organizations. They're particularly looking at the effective use of recycled materials which is so-called uh, circular economy concept introduced in Europe um, and Australia has taken it as well. So cram rubber, it becomes a successful product in Australia and the asphalt plastic, uh, recycled plastic asphalt payments has also been uh, recently researched and several um, collector roads, collector road means uh, it is not receiving too much traffic has been constructed and the payments are monitored uh, recently, I think over the last two years. And we haven't seen any failure in the plastic payments and the cram rubber payments yet. So, which is uh, good news. So payment material requirements. So some of the basic items are listed here. So in terms of the construction, as everybody knows, it should be able to be compacted and uh, should be economical. Right. Strength and stiffness. Strength means uh, it's able to resist the traffic loading and modulus or stiffness means it shouldn't bend too much to resist the loading. Therefore, we need to minimize the damage and the deformation on the load. Right. And then durability. So when we select the material, uh, it should be durable. That means it should long last for the period, for the period, at least for the period we selected 30 years, 50 years and so on. And there are other things, water resistant and the lower permeability as well. But when we say lower permeability, that's the concept called porous payment. Porous payments are used to collect the you know, natural rain water. But in this instance, we are not considering the porous payment because porous payments cannot sustain the heavy traffic loads. It can sustain certain vehicles like car and so on. Primarily porous payments are used to collect the water for recycling and so on. 
So characteristics of commonly adapted binders, which is astrod. So you might have seen astrods in my citations um, or in my uh, references. So astrods is the peak um, uh, body in Australia, uh, which um, uh, controls, or I would say leads all the road authorities and provides a guideline for them. So all the specifications and the standards for road construction, maintenance, design are developed by Astros. The Spark Hub um, uh, received fund from Astros to undertake uh, some uh, research activities, in particular intelligent compaction. So from the Astros standard, I have extracted um, the uh, table here, which shows the typical characteristics of uh, secondary binders and the primary binders. Right? I will not go through it in detail because you will be receiving the slides later. So if I touch on the cement, right, the cement is commonly used in uh, stabilization, basically in situ stabilization. Then as you say, stabilization effect, if you use a higher binder content, then it becomes more concrete. Right? Therefore, the fatigue cracking will be the predominant failure mechanism. And the cement is usable, suitable for stabilizing granular material as well as, as, well as some materials which are marginal. Right? And the bitumen and bitumen form bitumen will cover it later. And lime, uh, which is commonly used for subgrade stabilization in Australia, because subgrade means soft subgrade. If the subgrade has reasonable strength in terms of CBR, California bearing ratio. So, California bearing ratio over five, greater than five in Australia, it is considered to be reasonably good to CBR. CBR less than five, it is considered as a poor subgrade and normally they do some treatment like lime and lime, and lime stabilization and geogrid some insect. So there is a co-sample co extracted in the foam bitumen, just for your information. Uh, it is from TMR. TMR means uh, Transport Main Roads Queensland. So this payment is constructed uh, as a flood resilient payment. That means foam bitumen is excellent in performing under flood uh, condition. Queensland received a lot of flooding events within a year. Therefore, they are hungry for flood resilient payment. And foam bitumen becomes uh, more effective solution for them. And uh, there, is an, uh, there is a core here. It's about uh, 255 millimeter depth of foam bitumen payment and uh, natural uh, subgrade stabilized with lime. So this is a typ uh, typical um, uh, visual uh, appearance of these uh, two layers. All right, now I'm going to look at the unbound uh, granular payment in detail, right? So unbound granular payments or unbound granular materials uh, consist of crushed rock and certain amount of fines to meet the gradation for the compaction and the stability. So different type of grass rocks are here. So Melbourne has basalt and granite as well. And, uh, and closer to the city, uh, Melbourne has uh, low quality rocks like sandstone. So, the geotechnical parameters, just to recap on this, uh, because I want to emphasize the importance of degree of saturation in the upcoming slides. So this is a different um, uh, ways of defining the degree of saturation, right? SR we commonly use in Australia, and their equations are here. So GS is a specific gravity and typical range of specific gravity for sandstone and different type of rocks are here and clay. And GS is needed in order to calculate the degree of saturation, right? And degree of saturation, as you all know, cannot go beyond one. Maximum is uh, maximum value is one, right? So right density uh, normally measured in the field as a quality control parameter can be uh, measured with the different uh, test apparatus like NDG, nuclear density gauge and it can be correlated with the water content and water content can be correlated with DOS, degree of saturation. So I will discuss that when the test, field test uh, is presented. Right. Let's look at the um, distress mechanism commonly identified in unborn granular materials or unborn payments. 
So unborn payments, as I mentioned earlier, the predominant or the main failure mechanism is rutting, right? And how rutting occurs, because unbound granular material hasn't got any strength in terms of uh, uh, tensile. There is no tensile strength because you don't have cement in it or cementous binders are not there. So pre predominantly it phase through shear as well as the densification. Densification happens due to the traffic. So it's more zero rutting. Let me play this video. I'm not sure if your internet quality is not good. Uh, it, you may not see the animation. Right. So mode zero rutting is captured in this animation uh, and also in these figures that are taken from Europe. So what is mode zero rutting? So mode zero rutting takes place through the compaction of non-saturated materials in the payment structure. And in practice, some level of mode zero compaction always takes place in road structure after its construction. So it's in South African payment design, they normally allow for this um, rutting, which is a typical compaction uh, procedure uh, or compaction process take place at the top layer of the unbound granular, layer, granular material. And normally the construction compaction prior to the trafficking is sufficient to prevent further compaction on the trafficking. However, this mode of rutting is usually self-stabilizing. Some people is call it as uh, uh, shake down of the material. So although your roller, compaction roller, compacted this material, so what happens under traffic, which is a dy more dynamic load and repeated load. So this unborn granular particles try to stabilize itself when traffic dynamic load apply and it's positioned itself into the stable state. Therefore, you see some sort of initial rutting occurs. It also causes the compaction material to stiffen, thereby spreading the load better. Right? As the shakedown occurs, which indicates the more stable position of the aggregate, when you say more stable, it becomes more stiffer. Right? So we shouldn't expect further rutting after mode zero rutting occurs. If the payment is constructed in a good quality material and quality control is good. Then mode one rutting, let me play this video again. So mode one rutting happens in weak granular materials where local shear occurs closer to the weight. Uh, there's a photo taken at Norway. You can see the uh, typical of visual uh, appearance of this uh, port, uh, mode one rutting. And this type of rutting can therefore be considered to be largely a consequence of inadequate granular material shear strength in the aggregate, very near to the payment surface. That means very near to the traffic load. So evident from the trial payments and from the theory has also demonstrated that the maximum shear mode one rutting is filled with a depth of one third of the wheel width, right? So it happens almost in the first 50 to 75 millimeter, if I say in the uh, digits. So if the tire width is about uh, 300 millimeter, so first one third would be roughly like 100, 150, 110 millimeter. And more two rutting, it's the last type of rutting. Um, this rutting occurs as a whole payment rut, right? So which means the subgrade as, let me take the laser again. Sorry. So if you look at the rutting profile of the subgrade, so subgrades deform significantly than the base. So what happens here is the payment base is in a good quality. Therefore, you see the elastic response of the payment whereas subgrade material 
is not in a good quality. Therefore, you see significant amount of rutting here. I'm just marking it in the red line here. So the entire base layer here, it deforms in the elastic manner. And here, the subgrade receives the stress. However, it casts the plastic deformation occurs as well. So the entire pavement ruts. However, the subgrade has majority of the rutting, rutting taking place. Mode, oh sorry. Mode three rutting is an example from Sweden taken from uh, Rotex network. This type of rutting occurs due to the tire wear at the surface for abbreviation. And uh, this uh, type of rutting uh, need uh, immediate um, maintenance requirement because if the surface has um, impermeable layers become permeable, what happens is water get into the pavement, right? So this type of rutting causes by tire wear and it need urgent uh, repairs to prevent the water getting into the pavement. As I indicated earlier, water is the enemy because water creates more damage to the pavement under traffic loading. How do we test the performance of these materials and identify the necessary engineering properties to design them? Right? So UGMs, different type of unborn granular materials, like I said, class one to class four. So they are normally analyzed or examined through resilient modulus, okay, which is uh, uh, property used in the payment design as an input parameter and the permanent deformation, which is rutting, right? Rutting occurs under the cyclic loading, as I mentioned. So typically these two parameters in the laboratory are examined using RLT, repeated load triaxial test. Typical configuration is marked here, just similar to the triaxial setup, but here you can apply the cyclic load. So typical cost of this device is about uh, 80,000 Australian dollars if somebody wants to buy a new device for this purpose. So how RLT works, right? Schematic illustration of the stress strain or stress distribution across the sample is here. It's very similar to a triaxial, but here we are applying the dynamic law, that means the cyclic law, right? So triaxial stress here, sigma one and sigma three. Let me get the laser again. Sigma one, vertical reaction, and sigma three, the, which is a cell pressure. So what happens here is the sample experiences a deformation mainly in two ways. One is a volumetric deformation due to this confinement, which is also a compaction in the material itself. And then, then axial vertical deformation. So why this axial vertical deformation happens? Because you are applying the deviatic stress, which causes the vertical deformation. And at some stage, the soil or the sample will fail, right? That's called shear failure. This is a 1D element. That means an element test, which captures the essential behavior of this material under cyclic loading in the field, right? Then under cyclic loading, in the triaxial, how this material behaves is uh, uh, illustrated in this figure. And here is the stress. So RLT, this stress is determined based on the application of this material in the field and the expected traffic load or the traffic stress coming onto it. So typically this RLT stress can range from 300 kilopascal to 750 kilopascal in the triaxial. And they normally use one second loading period with the nine second rest period. So here it is just continuous cyclic illustration. But in the actual test, we normally give one second um, loading period, which is a half sign, and then nine second rest period. 
So if you apply the cyclic loading for on the compacted unbound granular material, how it's going to behave under the cyclic loading. So at the initial number of cycles, it's going to take certain number of, um, so certain amount of plastic deformation, which is a permanent one, cannot be recovered. And then it reaches the resilient stage where the modulus of the payment, in other words, the resilient modulus of the payment is constant. So the payment reaches the resilient stage after, uh, after um, the permanent deformation and no more permanent deformation is expected for a certain time. So this permanent deformation is typically in, in, in terms of distress mechanisms, the mode zero rutting, right? This permanent is anyway expected, even in the laboratory test, regardless of your compaction procedure. Even if you come back to the maximum density, the particles will still try to re reorganize uh, to its maximum stability. So it is typically mode zero rutting identified in the field, in the laboratory, depending on your loads and the sample compaction stage, initial compaction stage, the void ratio and density, it will, the magnitude of the permanent deformation will uh, change. <laughs> and this resilient modulus in the payment design, Australian payment design, this resilient modulus is commonly used uh, as an input parameter for the elastic analysis. And the effect of confining stress uh, on the Coulomb equation is uh, captured here. This is a failure envelope here, as you know, uh, and uh, anything below a linear elastic and the soil will fail uh, when it hits this um, uh, failure envelope position. I will cover this further in the next slide here. So what happens is uh, when degree of saturation in the payment is changes, that means when you change the water content, right, this failure envelope also changes. That means there is a certain contribution due to suction. So when degree of saturation, when the material is compacted, when degree of saturation changes, degree of saturation can change in two ways. One is by changing the water content, and the other is by compacting it further. So when degree of saturation changes, what happens is there is a contribution here, which is uh, primarily uh, apparent cohesion, and that shifts this failure envelope upwards Therefore, the payment material become more stable and strength, strengthened than the previous stage. Therefore, degree of saturation is an important parameter which contributes to the strength of the payment. Right? So if you control the degree of saturation very well in the payment, you are always away from this failure line. So what happens as you go closer to the pay failure line, so here we are talking about cyclic loading, right? repeated cyclic loading as applicable to the real payment in the field. So what happens is ABC denotes here ABC. So if we, are, if we are far away from the failure line, the payment here, vertical strain, or in other words, rutting or permanent deformation with number of load cycles, the payment reaches the shakedown stage. That means only the mode zero rutting, if you are in stage C, which is very away, far away from the failure stage, and then it's stable there, this mode zero rutting. What happens if you gradually increase the load in the payment, that means you are increasing the stress in the payment, which means you are going progressively towards the failure. If you further increase the stress, then what happens is your failure becomes more rapid. As Martin A. So typical modulus values ER uh, for payment design in Australia um, from uh, extracted from Astro's payment guide is shown here for high glide drugs 300 to 700, and typical vertical modulus used in the payment design is 500. So if you don't know or if you don't have the RLT apparatus, you are allowed to use these parameters as your typical values in the payment design, right? And the poison ratio values are also marked here, 0 0.35 and degree of anisotropy is um, two. That means 
your vertical modulus and horizontal modulus are not the same. Normally they use factor two. That means the vertical modulus equal to two times of the horizontal modulus in the payment structural design. Right. So RLT, like I mentioned, it is an element test capturing the essential behavior of the material. But in Australia, we have been using some other advanced test methods, which even capture more closely the field behavior than RLT. So one of that uh, device is the wheel tracker here. I'll run through this video. So here wheel tracker, I'm not sure whether you guys can see the video clearly. If the internet connection is uh, not great, uh, don't worry, uh, we'll send out the slides uh, after the slide, after the presentation. So what happens here is, um, in the triaxial, the sample size is too small, but here you are having a larger sample, right? In triaxial, the typical size is 100, 150 millimeter diameter, and the height is something like 300 millimeter. That's the element. But here you are compacting the payment layer into a large box, 700, 500, 300 is the large box. And you see the compactum procedure here. So what happens here is you compact, it, compact the material into that large box, right? And then you traffic the compacted layer using this um, setup, right? So trafficking speed is about three to 10 kilometer per hour. That is one of the limitations because it's not replicating what happens in the field, but it replicates a load conditions there in a um, close way, right? So rutting profile is extracted from Asphalt 2015 on your uh, left side. So what you see in the, uh, in the left side is let me get the browse. Yeah, what, see, what you see here is a rutting profile measured with the laser profilometers over this uh, payment uh, slab. So they use a laser profilometer after every 10,000, 20,000 cycles to capture the surface profile and then they back calculate the maximum rut depth from this, right? So this captures. Uh, the rutting behavior of this certain crush rock um, in a, a field behavior manner, right? So initial rutting is always observed uh, uh, in, the, in the evaluation, which is mode zero rutting as per our field evidence. Then the more advanced testing, which is uh, called accelerator load facility testing. I think I forgot to mention one thing here. So this wheel tracker, device would cost, if somebody want to buy this device and do the testing, this will cost about uh, 150,000 Australian dollars uh, if you want to buy the new device. Right, and the most advanced and um, very close simulation of the field traffic simulation is this uh, accelerated testing, uh, which is called uh, ALF in Australia, ALF. So here, you construct a real test permit, typically four meter by 12 meter size, and then you traffic the payment with the real axial configuration of the heavy vehicle, right? So heavy vehicle load typically in Australia for single axial can go up to 40 to 60 kilometer, and same load can be applied in the traffic uh, uh, test payment as shown in here. Right. So what we have done is we worked with ARRB, Australian Research, Research Board. Uh, and then during this um, accelerated payment, we have embedded distributed fiber optic sensing. The typical payment profile in the, in the, in the uh, ALF trafficking is shown here in this, in this figure. And uh, what you see here is the cross-sectional view of this payment, four meter wide, and 1.3 meter depth. And then what we have done is we installed the distributed fiber optic same sensors as marked in the color, blue color here. Three sensors were installed. One is at the top right below the seal. Another one is in the middle of the unbound layer. This is an unbound layer, middle of the unbound crush rock layer. And the last one is in the subgrade, right? So as this wheel moves on the surface, you see the fiber optic strain measurements on the bottom graph. It's a graphic illustration. So as wheel moves, right, the top fiber receives the most uh, significant strain because it's very close to the surface. And as 
uh, depth increases, the strain coming to the payment decreases, right? As it uh, captured by the distributed fiber optic chain uh, measurements. So this is the first of its kind in Australia, and this is the first study in Australia that is, uh, indicates that the fiber optic sensing setup can survive the heavy traffic loading and the distress mechanism occurred in the payment, in particular the unbound granular payment. So we are we are recently working, we are recently um, uh, submitted a paper uh, on this uh, or technical report on this uh, topic, and we'll be sharing the information further. So if anybody wants to construct and run an ALF testing for typical payment material, that will cost over five hundred thousand dollars just per test, one test. Right, empirical flexible design here. So how do we design the payment then? Right, so payments are typically designed using uh, unbound granular payments, typically designed using the CBR based design approach. This is so-called figure number 8.4 in Australia, which is a very famous figure in, in Australia because most of the payments are unbound and Australia heavily de depends on this empirical design chart. Right. How this empirical design chart works. So I will not cover this in detail due to the time limitation. However, the chart is developed since 1930 in USA using, um, using their real payment construction. They were trafficking the payments with different axial loads and they developed this chart based on the field evidence. Therefore, it is called empirical design. And how it works for different type of CBR, essentially the natural soil strength, you calculate the unbound granular layer thickness for the design traffic you want. So if you know your design traffic, you can calculate the thickness of the layer you want on the subgrade. So there's an example in the next slide I have, I have sort of illustrated here. So if you design for 2 million traffic, which is standard axial, then if your subgrade CBR is certain amount, in this instance, I think we selected five, then what would be the minimum thickness of your UGM, unbound grass rock, to be placed on the subgrade, that would be 450 millimeter. Imagine if you can improve the subgrade from CBR five to CBR 10, by means of cement stabilization or geogrid, then you would end up with reduction, significant reduction in the uh, UGM base, that means the crush rock base, and the value is here 300 millimeter, right? So if you improve the subgrade CBR from five to 10, you will reduce the cement base or UGM base thickness from 480 to 300. So it's kind of a cost benefit analysis you would do before you make the firm decision. You will have different options, then make the final decision based on the cost effective analysis. And another example here, I will not dwell on this due to the time limitation, but we'll send you the slides if you want to practice this. So based on the empirical design, which was predominantly developed by USA in 1930s, Australia has established a mechanistic approach using the uh, finite element software called Circly. And then how it works. So Circly, based on your payment configuration and the applied load, you calculate the strain coming to the subgrade. And then the strain is plugged into this equation to calculate the number of repetitions. Right. So for a design ESA or N, the cover thickness H is calculated by giving the EB, EB is the modulus of the base and ES is the subgrade. So I want to make one reference here. The reference base modulus EB is 350 megapascal, right? So this chart here, this empirical chart is developed based on the unbound granulium material modulus of 350 megapascal because unbound material, the one thing missing in this element here is unbound granular material modulus is not captured in this empirical design. So how it captured in Australian mechanistic approach is 
through these finite element software analysis. So they change the modulus here, and then vertical strain is changed according to the modulus you select for UGM, right? And then that strain is essentially used in this equation to calculate the allowable number of uh, repetitions for the performance of subgrade, which is radic. Right. So compaction. So after you analyze your performance in the laboratory, then you have the performance criteria, and now you are ready to compact or construct your payment. So how do we compact uh, payment? So normally, so there are two different compaction curves here. I would normally target uh, modified compaction here because modified compaction energy is normally used in, uh, in Australia. So what happens here is you target optimum moisture content and then maximum dry density here in the field. And normally we allow up to 95 to 98 relative density to be achieved in the field, right? And then after the compaction, so newly constructed unbound layers should be dry back to a certain degree of saturation, normally 65 before uh, the ceiling is placed. So why the payment is dry back, right? So reason is here, normally the degree of saturation or line of optimum here is 80% to 90%, depends on the material type. And then when you dry back, what happens is your degree of saturation changes this size, right? So there are two main reasons why payments are dry back in the field before we place a seal or before it can be traffic, right? This is a dry back process and you will end up with some degree of saturation value here. So why they have been practicing that? First, uh, the first answer is to place a seal, you need to have a good surface and you need to have good bonding. Therefore, the payment should be reasonably dry. And the second answer is clear. What happens here in the suction? So, so this is your degree of saturation, SR opt or line of optimum in other words. Right? You come back to this position. And when you try back, what happened to the suction here? Right? Suction is dramatically increasing when you try back. Right? Increasing suction, remember, going back to the Moculum equation, you are increasing the strength of the material. Right? So what happens when you try back the payment? Degree of saturation changes. In other words, degree of saturation reduces. That increases the metric suction. Increases the strength in turn. So after the payment is constructed, right, the moisture. So this is the dryback process, and further drying, and then climate changes happen. Right, these are the climate changes. So seasonal changes, groundwater going up and down, and the infiltration of water due to drain and things like that can uh, can change the moisture content in the payment. Therefore, the CBR for the granular base which is CBR is California bearing ratio, which is normally used in the payment design. 10 times of CBR normally used to calculate the resilient modular, which is very presumptive assumption, I would say. However, this is how they are designed. So ER is a resilient modular and 10 times CBR. So CBR is, basically the design parameter. Why? Because it goes to the modulus equation and then modulus is used in the design. CBR is selected considering the rainfall, right? If the rainfall is too high, what would happen is your material need to be considered under the soak condition. That means you will use a soak CBR because you, you know that it's going to have too much water into the subgrade. Therefore, they directly use a soak CBR. So that's why they're here, they mentioned they saw CBR, right? And then what happens when, okay, this part I have explained earlier, this is the Ryback process, right? So as soon as you Ryback, you provide good service, or sorry, good surface for the payment layer to be sealed, as well as you provide good strength of the material because your suction increases as well. So during the course of this payment life, what happens, right? 
so this seasonal change moisture go up and down right because this seasonal change due to many reasons like i mentioned ground water and rain and so on and if the seal get damaged then more water will come in therefore this is your initial process and right after construction then you can even go to the right side or you can go to the west side but what happens if the pavement is too wet right that mean you are even passing the srl degree of uh, uh, srl means this is a line of optimum where the maximum performance happen so after this what happens is your pavements going to fail even under small traffic load right so it's a common failure mechanism uh, we found if the pavement is not properly constructed or if pavement subjected to climatic change including a significant rainfall so after this initial stable right what happens is if the pavement is expected to receive more water by many means including the surface distresses like mod uh, mod 4 rutting sorry mod 3 rutting when surface has more cracks allows more water that mean you are asking the unbound material to get into trouble right so this side it's always immediate no, i would i wouldn't say immediate failure it depends on the road depends on the load depends on the traffic repetition the failure will occur so we never allow the pavement to wet so either we use your textile and good seal or rehabil rehabilitate the seal and so on to maintain the water content Uh, I think we can now take a couple of questions. I'm running uh, almost two hours now, um, so if uh, time allows, um, we can have probably a few minutes break before I move on to the cementious materials, and then I have about another half an hour to to complete this section. So if you have any questions, uh, please. Uh, I don't know the procedure whether you want to put it in the chat box or if you want to ask directly. Also, it's possible. um maybe while we are having few minutes break uh, we can clarify any questions if you are not too tired okay if anybody have question you can ask i think it is very very good session thank you thank you very much uh, thank you you uh, are at the midnight you are doing <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you if anybody don't have any question i think can ask the uh the, there is a question in the chat box yeah there's a question in the chat box maybe i'll read that question Yeah, the question is: Can any pavement, flexible or rigid type, that is designed based on uh, three or four days CBR value, be allowed to become uh, submerged, submerged up to top? Yeah, that's a very good question. So normally, uh, CBR is not used for rigid pavement. Rigid pavements normally concrete and uh, heavily bound uh, pavements. They normally use. Uh, Uh, flexural modulus and uh, flexural stiffness uh, and flexural strength as a design parameter so cbr is not used for rigid pavements but for the flexible pavements uh, when you say uh, allowed to submerge so we normally take the conservative approach to design the pavement right for example say there is a 
Um, in Queensland, it normally happens. Uh, there is a flood uh, uh, area where we want to compact the pay construct the pavement. So what we normally do is we normally take the conservative approach to take the unsoak, uns sorry, soak CBR, and then we design the pavement. But when we construct, we take all the measures to prevent water getting into the pavement. Right? So we are conservative in both ways, in design and in construction. So in construction, we either use geotexide and use subsurface surface drainage properly, such that the pavement is not uh, uh, flooded with the water. I hope that clarifies the question. Perhaps we can move to the move on to the next uh, uh, part of the presentation as we are running a uh, little late. Uh, if that's okay, Chairman. Yes. If any. There is no question. I think you can move to it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. All right. The next material that I'm going to cover here is a cementious material. Right. So previously we discussed the unbound material and its uh, testing and uh, design protocol. So cementious material, which commonly uh, includes GP, GB, general purpose, general blind, blend, and then fly ash things like that, and how this material used in the practice. So there are two ways this material can be effectively used. One is in-situ stabilization, which I mentioned earlier, is a common practice in Australia for the old for degraded payments. And then other one is the plant mix stabilization. That means you prepare the material in the plant by mixing the cement with the crushed rock, and then you bring the mixture to the site and then come back. Right, that's a plant mix stabilization. What is the common distress mechanism of this payment? Right, the common distress mechanism, as I indicated in the stress strain analysis, this type of payments are considered in between semi rigid and rigid, and the failure mechanism is fatigue due to its payment response under traffic loading. It is a bending, right? So, bottom of fatigue cracking is commonly referred to as. Uh, uh, the failure mechanism for this type of material. And then fatigue. So those who don't know the fatigue, uh, so fatigue can be broadly defined as a progressive and a localized structural deterioration that occurs when a cyclic loading or repetitive loading is applied. Right. So this payment bends due to the traffic loading and it repetitively events. Therefore, the cracks at the bottom propagate to the top as a tensile fatigue. So what happened to the modulus over the course of payment life, cumulative traffic loading, as number of loads increases, this resilient modulus drops with cycle. Right. So when I say resilient modulus, remember this type of payments bends, therefore they take into account the flexural modulus or bending modulus in the payment. Also in the, in the, find more. In the, in the payment uh, analysis, in the um, real payment performance, people have uh, identified the failure mechanism crushing when you use a thick payment, thick cement DS material, right? So if you take 300, 400 depth of the payment, which is commonly used in South Africa due to the heavy traffic applications, what happens is your payment undergoes crushing so what is crushing, which is a top-down cracking in terms of fatigue. And uh, crushing is captured in a simple way in this UCS diagram. So if I use my pen here, so closely look at this UCS value. This UCS value is generated, was generated using the DCP, dynamic cone penetration test data, so there's a direct correlation between DCP, dynamic cone penetration and UCS, which is unconfined compressive strength. And what happened here is you have the UCS value before trafficking. That means this is as build payment with the depth. This is the payment depth, right? So 100 millimeter depth layer is captured, but the actual payment depth is more than 100, but they have only captured the 100 part. So what happens is the UCS has small reduction at the start, and then it plateau out, and then it decreases with depth. 
Then after trafficking, what happened? This trafficking has, I think, certain number of cycles. I can't remember the exact value. It is more than 10,000 cycles. Your UCS has gone down from the initial value. In particular, closer to the top part of the payment. So what does it mean? This payment has progressively failed in compression, not in shear. This is a compression failure because you have reasonable cement in this payment, right? So UCS has gone down, which indicates the crushing, right? There's a UCS failure. <laughs> this was taken during my PhD. I was testing a um, cement as material. So this is a typical UCS failure, unconfined compressive strength failure. And in Australia, the payment is classified in three categories, modified, lightly bound, and clearly bound. The modified and lightly bound are commonly considered under flexible payment category, like I mentioned earlier, and heavily bound is considered under rigid category. They are typical design modular, and the typical UCS values are captured in this table. And design modulus, like I mentioned earlier, is flexor and modulus, not resilient or, or cyclic modular. It is a flexor and modulus. It's different to UGM, unbound granular material. Right. So how do we assess the fatigue? the flexural fatigue performance. So now we understand under cyclic loading, this payment resists the loading by enduring the fatigue damage, but how do we design for fatigue? So question is, how do we then assess the fatigue performance? So here I have illustrated the CTB response using the numerical modeling, understand the standard axial load is captured here, and here is your CTB layer. So how the stress and strain vary in the CTB layer through numerical modeling, it en encapsulated in this figure. And the plan view of this loading is shown here, right? So sigma yy, which is the longitudinal stress applied in the payment due to the standard axial loading, sorry. And sigma xx, is applied in the transverse direction due to the standard axial loading is marked in this figure along the direction of travel. And you can see the longitudinal stress is much more higher than the transverse stress, sigma excess. Right? You may ask, why are you worrying about sigma y and sigma xx instead of sigma set set? Right? So I mentioned that. The failure mechanism is fatigue due to the bending. So when bending occurs, the bending can happen as I marked in these beams here, the bending can occur in two ways. One is through beam A, other one is through beam B. So beam A represents the sigma XX stress condition, which is along transverse direction, right? So beam A bends, that generates sigma XX. Then beam B bends, that generates sigma yy. Right. So beam A and beam B are representing sigma xx and sigma yy respectively. But which one is more critical? Sigma yy, like I mentioned here. But to be more realistic and to be more practical, we should assess both together because it comes under multi-axial fatigue analysis. I don't want to explain it in too detail because there will be a lot of jargon and it's difficult to understand in a short time. So ideal analysis would be multi-axial fatigue considering beam A, beam B together. But in this instance, it was done during my PhD. What we have identified is that sigma YY is much more critical than sigma XX. Therefore, we choose in beam B in the laboratory to do four-point bending setup to assess the fatigue failure under sigma yy. That means the model results from numerical analysis has been used together in the laboratory using this four-point bending apparatus to assess the fatigue performance. By this apparatus, so-called four-point apparatus, which typically $50,000 if somebody wants to buy, which represents the beam B in the field. And then what we do is we apply the stress here based on this diagram, 
this values here we apply the stress on the on the four point bending apparatus and then we try to simulate the traffic loading here let's see the actual loading so what i have done is here this is the tandem axial right the actual traffic loading i simulated in the laboratory through numerical modeling as you hear the noise and this load is applied on the sample here and this is a four point bending sample not sure everybody can see it this is the internet so you may not able to but we will see it a bit later here the load is applied at the beam here is the load as per the traffic so we have applied this spectrum for tandem axial three axial and here is the beam the beam is subjected to the four point bending loading And it is a first of kind in Australia during my PhD time. So we developed the stress curve for the critical part B and B, and we applied this stress to the four-point bending as you saw in this figure. And then uh, I will show you the typical failure of this load. So what happens here is um, B is failing right under this cyclic load. Here is the failure. So it, once you apply the load again and again. this progressive fatigue becomes a uh, uh, catastrophic failure as you see in the beams and here is the beam sample we prepared we prepared several different sizes of the beams to analyze various parameters the figure here clearly explains the flexural modulus Variation with number of load cycles, which sorry, which indirectly captures the fatigue failure. I'm trying to get the laser pen. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so flexural modulus is the typical input parameter in the payment design, as I mark here. And what happens? during the cyclic loading in the four point bending is again the plastic deformation plastic deformation increases or permanent deformation or progressive damage happens as number of load cycles increases so flexor modulus is the input parameter for cement treated base design and how it varies with the cycles so flexural modulus is in the laboratory determined by flexural stress applied in the cyclic manner in the flexural strain measured using the deflection at the middle of the beam right so if this flexural modulus reduces with time that means this gradient is decreases with time due to the progressive damage which is in terms of fatigue right so fatigue damage is captured in this manner and then what happened to the flexural modulus once it reaches a certain stage normally 50% of the initial modulus or flexural modulus at 25% which is actually the incurrent material property then we decided we 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 define it as a fatigue failure right that mean the effective fatigue life here is marked as the number of load cycles that required to reduce the modulus of the payment from initial value to its 50% that is commonly referred to as the flexural fatigue life of the payment right then based on this definition what we do is we change this sigma max in the laboratory in the four point bending sigma max, max is changed in order to capture the number of load cycles at that stress level and then we develop the stress strain relationship which is so called the fatigue curve right sigma is changed number of load cycle is captured for that sigma and then particular number of load cycles is basically for particular stress level right so how this n is captured based on this analysis here 50% and how this analysis is captured that based on the four point bending apparatus results right this is the typical analysis I wouldn't go into detail due to the time limit. However, it's an interesting topic. Let's look at the fatigue curves in the next slide. 
So based on this experimental results, uh, we have come up with a stress-based fatigue model, which I explained. Don't worry about this jargon here. Essentially, this is sigma versus n, stress versus number of load cycles, the fatigue curve in, in, in cementious materials. And what I have done is during my PhD, we developed this fatigue curve for different curing ages, seven day, 28 day, and 90 day. That means the cemented base beam prepared was cured for several days, seven day, 98, and sorry, seven, 28, and 90, and then it tested in the four point bending apparatus and the fatigue performance was analyzed. So what you see on the right hand side is the cement layer thickness. This is a typical design using the laboratory data for different curing yet. So your cement layer thickness and the number of standard axials, or in other words, ESAs in the payment design is captured in the x-axis. So one million means uh, one into 10 to the power six uh, repetitions. So if somebody want to design a payment for one million, and what type of payment? Cement eaters payment, cement treated payment. What would be the thickness they need if they want to open the payment just seven days after construction, they need this much, 360. And if they want to wait 28 days, what, how much thickness they need this much? If they want to wait even further for 90 days, this they would need this much. Remember the modulus and the subclay because cement yes, material is not the only layer in the payment. There are other layers as well, subgrade as well as asphalt bearing course. You need to take that into account as well. So assuming that your subgrade is 5% and your bearing course is 30 millimeter, if somebody wants to construct a CTB layer and they want to urgently open, what happens is it doesn't gain the strength. Therefore, it requires a certain time to cure. But if you want to open it, you want to prevent the failure. You don't want the payment to fail just after seven days. So you need to provide enough thickness such that your payment, even under lower strength, it sustains the required traffic. But if your payment can be opened later, because you don't have any pressing need of opening the road, then you can wait while the cement treated base gains strength, right? That means you will need only less thickness, right? So if normally in Australia, they don't wait for 90 days to open the road. It's not practical as well if the roads are constructed in the institute base and the rehabilitated for urgent opening. So what we then uh, analyzed is the fatigue endurance limit concept. So assuming that they are opening the road immediately or shortly after construction, which is normally seven days, then we identified the minimum layer thickness required right, to prevent the early fatigue damage to that layer, right? That means, do you open the layer or do you open the traffic for the, for the uh, construction uh, cement treated base if the minimum layer thickness is achieved within, within the specifications? Right? If, I, if, I exam, if I take an example, say this is seven days curing, uh, I wanted to check the minimum CTB layer thickness for my asphalt layer thickness 200. Right, so I'm constructing 200 millimeter asphalt layer thickness for a given traffic, and then my subgrade CBR uh, for this instance I would take is 15. 15 is quite good. Then what is the minimum layer thickness I would need is 200 mm. There's a lot of design analysis behind this, a lot of numerical work and experimental work behind this, but this is a simplified chart which captures the essential information for the payment design. So minimum CTB layer thickness, if I have an asphalt layer 200 over the CTB, that means your CTB layer is here, right? This is your cement treated base and you are constructing the asphalt here. This is an asphalt layer thickness, right? Sorry, I'm, I'm not using the right uh, thing. 
200 millimeter. And then here, this is a subgrade, right? If the subgrade is 15 CBR, you want to construct a CGB, which need to be open in seven days, and you got an asphalt layer 200 millimeter. So your minimum layer thickness is 200 millimeter. That minimizes the early age damage. Right. Further, during, uh, during this uh, cement treated base project, we have identified that in Australia, over 27% of the traffic has this single axial dual tear. 32% of the traffic has TADT, tandem axial dual tire, and then TRDT is 34. So that's all together summed up to be more than 80%. So more than 80% of the traffic consists of this. Then what we said is, look, this has to be analyzed in terms of fatigue performance for this analysis, TADT, TRDT, and then we developed the fatigue curve similar to the single axial we have developed the fatigue curve for all three axles. So the video you have shown earlier, like the first of kind in Australia, that video was prepared for TRDT. That means that beam was subjected to TRDT axial loading. Therefore, this curve here, the curve that was developed from that video was this one, TRDT, tandem axial. Then using the fatigue curves here, we have identified the maximum loads that can be applied on this payment, sorry, that can be applied on this payment after 28 day period. So I will not describe the analysis part behind it, but in a simple, uh, simple uh, graphic illustration, what I can tell you is if you want your payment to receive TADT, tandem axial, dual tire, what would be the maximum load that you can put on this TADT if your CTB layer thickness is 150 millimeter, right? And then you have STADT here. If I draw the line here, it would be somewhere like, I would say 80 kilo newton, right? That's a maximum, right? So if somebody opens a road after 28 day curing, and if they want to avoid the occurrence of fatigue damage, then they would need at least 150 millimeter layer thickness if they want, excuse me, if they want to allow 80 kN axial load. If they want to allow further, right? If they want to allow more axial load, then they need to increase the layers. For example, say if they want to allow 150 kN TADT, what they would need is they would need to increase the base thickness to 250 such that the payment is not failing. So that's the end of semen treated base construction, testing, and design. So now let's now look at the original topic of this uh, payment uh, of this talk, which is payment quality assurance and quality practice, quality assurance and quality control practice. So for UGM and semen treated base, mainly the density measurement is considered as uh, the density and moisture measurement is considered as. Uh, uh, important criteria and uh, density measurements are normally done using nuclear density gauge and nuclear density gauge as uh, um, jotted down here it measures the bulk density right it can also measure the um, moisture content in gravimetric form however the accuracy is subjective it depends on the person and how you person the ndg device and the depth at which you tested the um, material um, contributes to the uh, erroneous calculations or measurements. And then typically the quality control criteria uses the density ratio, which is more than 95% uh, relative density. And uh, if we measure the volumetric constant more precisely using this uh, device, then we would be able to calculate the degree of saturation. Remember, why do you need degree of saturation? But well, we got to make sure the payment is right back to 60% or 65% of degree of saturation, which is a quality control before they put the seed. But why do we need 60%, 65% degree of saturation, like I mentioned earlier, to provide the good bonding or good surface for the seal, as well as the payment gets strength when suction increases due to the degree of saturation. 
right? So here's the NDG test uh, um, the detail I have put together. So NDG test, non, um, it's a non, uh, uh, sorry, nuclear density gauge, but it is not a non-destructive test. You still need to make a hole to measure the density. So in the direct transmission mode, uh, it's used for testing compacted uh, earth works as well as unborn materials. And the backscatter method is normally used in asphalt, and Sudha will be covering that uh, briefly in the next uh, slides, sorry, in the upcoming uh, presentation. And the, in the direct transmission uh, test, the gamma source, yeah, uh, gamma source basically referred here, so I used, uh, Again, the gamma source is here. The gamma source is placed into the material by means of a punched or real hole to the desired test step, and then by releasing the hand, by hand to hand release. The maximum depth that uh, this NDG can go down is 300 millimeter. 300 millimeter depth can be used, can be tested with this NDG, right? And then, once, uh, once the test is started, the detectors in the gauge record the count rate of the radiation transmitted directly through the soil layer and display the wet density reading, right? So a more dense material absorbs more radius, as we know already, and the resulting in the lower gamma count reading, which converts to the higher wet modulus. Oh, sorry, higher wet density. So what happens here is, so, Get the mouse here. So this density basically captures the soil volume as I circle here. So when you insert the uh, gamma source and it goes to the depth of 300 millimeter, when the rays or the, or the detectors identify the radiation, so essentially it reports the density of this part only. Remember, that's very important. It doesn't report the density of this part. So it's so spot on and it's a limited volume is measured for density. So it doesn't represent the entire compaction area. That's highly important. And NDG tests often require the licensed person. And during the test, you got to make sure at least three meter distance minimum between the person to minimize the radiation effect. So let me move on to the next one. Yeah, the NDG, Accuracy is marked here. It's for the particular model, model 340. So if the NDG testing is performed for 55, 15 seconds, that means your gamma source exerts the radiation for this section. Your position or the accuracy is marked here. So in a nutshell, I don't want to go through all these points here. What I wanted to emphasize here is as the time increases, for the gamma source to provide more radiation, the accuracy of the density measurement also increases as you saw here, right? Four minute, one minute, 15 seconds. However, due to the time limitations in the field, you've got to do a lot of density testing from one lot to another lot, and minimum six tests per lot as is construction quality control. Typically, people select one minute as the typical radiation time. But uh, in research, we normally go for four minutes, four minutes, as we don't have any time limitation or construction uh, limitation. And the uh, cutting edge technology here is uh, from USA, uh, non-nuclear non soil density gauge. Uh, if, you can, if you want more information, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, you can connect you with the uh, company, which is Transec from USA. They are working uh, in intelligent compaction with us. So this density basically estimated by this device uh, uh, in the sense of electrical sensing field, which changes the electrical impedance of the material mix. And that essentially a function of the composite electric constant, elect the electric constant of the soil and the air trapped in the void, right? So since the dielectric constant of air is much lower than that of the soil consistency, as compaction increases, the combined dielectric constant increases because of the percentage of air in the soil metric decreases. Right. So this is a non-Euclidean technology. That means you don't have any hazardous 
when the test is operated. Also, it is a non-destructive measurement. That means you can directly place this material on the surface of the pavement, and then you make the measurement. However, the depth of testing is limited. It goes up to 100 millimeter and 150 millimeter, respectively, depend on depend on the uh, device you buy. Right. So other quality assurance or quality control measurement is modulus. Right. For cementitious material, remember we are selecting the flexoron modulus or the bending modulus as the design parameter, which is analyzed in the laboratory as well. So we want to make sure this uh, material has reached the modulus we want or the design modulus we want. So there are different material, me, sorry, test methods available in the market. LWD, uh, lightweight deflectometer, plate load test, um, uh, clock camera, and then geo gauge as well. Um, I will not go through each of these. However, LWD test, which we have been working on over the last six months, I will present some of the basic results from that. And there are other methods commonly available include Panda Prop, uh, which mainly uh, working based on the cone tip resistant blow. And then DCP, which is a very um, uh, you know, uh, common and also traditional test in USA, dynamic concentration. And the traditional and whole test method is the California bearing ratio, CBR. So people normally do in-situ CBR as well uh, for uh, quality control, but all of these are uh, these are non, uh, sorry, these are destructive tests. Right? That means you are going to damage the payment even in a small way when you do the testing. Typical factors to consider repeatability uh, and, uh, and this uh, um, duration of the testing also a function because uh, uh, construction has very tight schedule uh, due to the uh, opening of the road. So we cannot delay their process and the stress condition and cost as well. So LWD, light by deflectometer. So how it functions, right? So LWD is also uh, used as a quality assurance or so quality control tool mainly for modulus. And there are two different type of these devices as I described here, right? So LWD device, basically it casts a roping weight here as you can see, which is a known mass from a known height, right? And when it um, hits the ground, you place this base plate on the ground. When it hits the ground, this load plate applies a load. So during the dynamic motion, what we are measuring as a response from the ground is the deflection, right? Deflection of the ground, right? And then other one is the force applied on the ground, right? So deflection and force are measured by two different sensors. Force is measured by load cell here, as you can see here, and the deflection is measured in the geoform or accelerometer. Right. So as I mentioned, there are two different methods or two different apparatus commonly available in Australia or in USA as well. What are those two different methods? One is the load cell with the geoform, and other is load cell with the accelerometer. Right. What happens here, load cell with geoform is, Load cell apply the force and the force is, sorry, the, the mass apply the force and the load cell calculates or measures the force. However, when it's come to the deflection, this geophone directly measures on the ground itself. That means it really measures the soil surface deformation here. But whereas on the other device, while load cell measures the force applied by this rock mass, this accelerometer attached on this load plate measures the load plate deflection. So accelerometer readings will be integrated, double integrated to get the deflection, right? So there's two different mechanisms to measure the deflection. One is geoform, which is directly resting on the ground and it measures the ground deflection. And other is accelerometer, which is attached on the load plate and that measures the road plate deflection. So which is more accurate? I wouldn't bias to the um, uh, commercial aspects, but geophone, which directly measures the soil deflection would be more accurate than this um, load plate deflection. 
However, in the field, what happens is this has large variability as soil um, uh, uh, disturbs by the CO4. But in the in the in the uh, accelerometer device, you have less variability. When I say variability, that means the coefficient of variation for a given lightweight deflectometer modulus. Here, coefficient of variability is high. Here, coefficient of variability is small due to the nature of different measurements. Right. So lightweight deflectometer here, I'm just uh, uh, showing the video of one of our experiments. See how it exerts a load. Right? It is a um, sort of uh, non-destructive method. Right? And then you are capturing the ground response by capturing the deflection and the force. And here's the deflection curve, sorry. Here's the deflection curve. Uh, and and associated the force curve captured here, deflection curve and the force curve. So from this uh, elastic half phase theory, you can calculate the modulus. So I'm not going to go through that in detail. So E is basically function of uh, sigma naught and shape factor is absolutely important depending on the test material, this shape factor will change. So shape factor takes into account the stress distribution below the uh, load shell or below the load plate. So I want to emphasize one thing here, this lightweight deflectometer measures some type of modulus, but that modulus is not the modulus used in the design, right? Design we use flexural modulus. For UGM it is resilient modulus. Therefore, there's no direct link with the LWD measurement and the design. So why do we need the LWD then? It works as a quality control. That means uniformity of the payment layer is assessed with the LWD. However, we are not ensuring that your design performance is captured or design parameter is captured in the LWD, right? So one example here, uh, I'm, I'm just going to explain it with the laser, oops, sorry. So one example here is um, say your target field compression, which is typically 95%, right? For your uh, sand, right? There are two types of sand. Let's consider silicon one, right? This one. Then what would be your target LWD 35, right? right? This is established based on the laboratory test results or whatever the field test results. They already know if you want to reach your degree of compaction in the field as a quality control 95%, then you've got to make sure that your minimum LWD is 35. Right. What we do, a quality assessment person will go to the field, he do the LWD test at selected spots, and then he will make sure anything fall beyond this point is passed, and anything fall below this point is not accepted. So the contractor need to, I don't know, need to check the moisture content or need to find a way why the modulus or the quality control is not satisfied, right? But keep in mind that LWD is mainly depending on a lot of parameters, which include density, degree of saturation, size of the loading plate, rope weight, rope height, and so on and so forth. So it's highly sensitive device. So successful use of this device as a quality control test method in the field is always challenging for geotechnical engineers. And the final one, before we move on to the intelligent compaction, uh, is uh, the proof rolling concept, right? So proof rolling concept, this method basically set out the procedure for assessing the stiffness and the compaction uniformity of payment layer during construction. And it's still used in Australia. It's very traditional method and probably over 40, 50 years we have been using it. And uh, how it works? by observing the surface deformation of a layer and a moving heavy roller, and the roller parameters are here, it could be a truck or roller, and the person assessing the deformation, you can see in the example, here there are two people walking uh, next to the rug, and here's the loader truck, and this is a payment constructed, I think it's a cement stabilized uh, subgrade. Uh, so the person assessing the deformation examine the surface deformation under the roller, the heavy roller as perceptible or not perceptible, 
at specified locations only by the contractor and as a uniform or non-uniform over the entire lot, right? And it's a visual um, observation, right? So perceptible deformation may be visual permanent deformation or lasting and resilient. It can be both lasting and lasting. Plastic and lastic contribute to the deformation, right? So the main challenge here is the difficulty of this uh, method, right? Because this method evaluation standard is that no visible, no perceptible deflection is highly sub subjective measure, right? Depends on the person and his visibility as well. Therefore, it is believed that the state of the art intelligent compaction technology would be a better replacement for this testing. And that's our next topic, intelligent compaction. So what is intelligent compaction? And, uh, and uh, this is a recent technology uh, people have been sort of researching on it. And we just let me introduce this topic uh, uh, after this uh, proof rolling. So intelligent compaction, I, I have a short animation video as well collected from Boomac. Let me play that while I'm explaining. So there will be no sound from this. Hope you can see the animation. So intelligent compaction is a more recent and evolving technology uh, in the in the construction industry, and which uses modern rollers, right? In 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 particular the vibratory rollers, right? Which is used for asphalt compaction and the UGM compaction. Uh, and the roller is equipped with various sensors, including accelerometer and the higher accurate GPS onboard report system and a feedback control system, right? For asphalt payments, we normally use uh, temperature sensors as you see here, temperature sensor, because temperature is important for asphalt. So temperature is being measured, right? The IC technology was first introduced in Europe in 1970s. I imagine it's almost 50 years since then. This technology facilitates the real-time monitoring of the material, right? In terms of compaction, and it automatically adjusts the compaction process to meet the material stiffness requirements specified by the user or contractor. The material response and the level of compaction and the applied compaction effort are monitored by this accelerometer attached on the roller drum, right? So during the compaction process, IC rollers continue generating the color code map and the color code maps can be generated for number of load passes for a particular location and the roller location and the speed, right? So with that, without I explain this uh, theory behind this intelligent compaction, because there are a lot of jargon behind it, I would like to play a video which clearly explains the essential part of the intelligent compaction uh, from the BUMAC roller. So if the internet is good, you should be able to see this video without any time lag. This is the target value. Target EV, IB means they want to attach, attain 100 meganewton per meter. That is the target one. Current value is recorded here, on the file. The target is Chandra. It does automatically without the driver adjustment. See how this response changes as the material in the payment changes. It is an automated process based on the response received from the ground. See, this material is completely different. And then see the material response and the associated roller response changes as per the material. The waves reflected from the roller is the response of the roller. Our 
target is Chandra, then it is, the roller is telling Chandra has already been achieved as the uh, final um, target value. I hope uh, that uh, has given some good information, but I just want to emphasize one thing here. Um, although the intelligent compaction roller target um, uh, modulus value is 100 uh, mega Newton per meter squared, this area here, you see the final value is still 55 mega Newton per meter squared, which means it doesn't satisfy the requirement 100, but you can ask why the reason is the material here cannot be compacted to reach that modulus hundred because it's too soft. They have put purposely the regiform kind of material into the pavement and they tried compacting to the requirement, which is hundred mega Newton meter per hundred mega Newton per meter square. However, the roller couldn't achieve that. Therefore, it left that area uncompacted because it's kind of a regiform it going back and forth cannot be compacted. Right, so limitation of this current technology, although we call it an intelligent compaction technology, it is not really true intelligent, right? Therefore, what happens here is intelligent compaction measurement value, which is one of the measurement parameters from the roller, does not correlate with density. Density is our requirement. Therefore, it doesn't, uh, doesn't so it doesn't correlate with density, so it is not truly really intelligent. And IC technology is still unable to measure directly the elastic modulus, which I have highlighted even in the LWD measurement. The modulus we use in the design is not measured by any of these devices which discussed earlier. And there is no established cost benefit analysis. And it is reported that three to 5% additional cost has been occurred if somebody want to occupy intelligent compaction roller. And it requires significant amount of training. So within Spark Hub, we are forefront in researching intelligent compaction technology and advancing in this tech, advancing this technology to make rollers truly intelligent by means of advancing the density measurement to be in real time based on re, deflection based technique, and then measuring the moisture content using ground penetration radar. And Sudha will be presenting the intelligent compaction measurement value for ASPOL. So we want to enhance the correlation between ICMP and the density measurement. Therefore, you can target certain density. And also we are progressing towards performance-based compaction, right? That means you compact the payment to your design specification, right? And then develop IC analytics to facilitate measurements with advanced sensing technology for sensing uh, advanced sensing technology for density and moisture content uh, in order to achieve the performance based construction. So here, yeah, typical um, the payment, uh, our test payment, typical test payment constructed in the warehouse is shown here. And this is our research uh, team for intelligent compaction. You see the GPR device here, LWD device here, non linear negative density device here, and the roller with the sensors, accelerometer, deflectometer, and so on. And this is our PhD scholars. And, uh, and the research fellows. And this area on your right, left side, that's the asphalt payment. The one uh, on the left side is soil, unborn granular material, and one on the left side is asphalt in the field. Same research team, but here we use uh, temperature, thermal camera, and so on for the IC. So with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll wind up the session. So we have put together a good set of references here. Once we send this PDF out to you, when you click on this link, it will take you to the PDF. You can sort of download for your, for your uh, study or for your design or whatever. So oh, if you need further details, please feel free to send us an email. We should be able to get these documents for you. So we have put together different uh, uh, countries uh, test standards and the uh, design standards uh, and so on. Thank you very much for your attention, Benjamin. Sorry for the long um, um, presentation. I hope it was valuable and you make value out of it. And uh, there are some questions in the chat box. Uh, 
Um, yeah, if that's okay, I can take a few more few questions and then pass it on to Sudha. Uh, if that's all, all right. Yeah, sure. You can move to the questions. Okay, no problem. Okay, the first question is, I'm not sure I need to share the slides for any of these questions, but I will get the slides ready as well. How the asphalt payment behave on stabilized earth with out granular base, aggregate base? Right, that's also a good question. So asphalt payment, so Sudha will be covering the asphalt payment. Due to the time, I have only covered the cement and unbound, but we are planning to have another separate session for asphalt. So asphalt payments in Australia, there are full debt asphalt payments. When I say full debt asphalt payments, those payments have about 300, 400 millimeter debt, right? And if the climate is good, they don't construct the sub base, they directly construct the asphalt layer on top of the subgrade. Right. So depend upon the um, geological conditions and the climate of that area, they select the base and sub base. If the asphalt payment is full that the asphalt payment and if the climate and geological conditions are good, then it can be constructed directly on the subgrade. The performance of the uh, asphalt uh, should not be a problem. But normally, um, asphalt, full that asphalt payments uh, goes with uh, goes with because asphalt water is not a problem. Asphalt performance is significantly affected by the air void, air void content. Right, higher the air void content, higher the rotting of the asphalt and the fatty. So asphalt payments directly placing on the subgrade uh, is not an issue. However, they got to make sure the proper bonding. So normally they put a cement slurry to make sure the bonding with subgrade and the full depth asphalt payment and then uh, they construct a thin seal at the top. Right? If the payment is not the full dead asphalt payment, but if the payment is an asphalt payment having other layers, then asphalt payment typically uh, constructed over cement treated base to sustain large traffic load. And uh, this typical payment construction is on the, on the soft subgrade because you need to move base and more strengthen base to prevent uh, fatigue failure or rutting failure of the subgrade. So to answer the question directly, yes, asphalt payments, full debt asphalt payment can be constructed directly on the uh, uh, subgrade, which is the natural ground, given that the environmental conditions are good, as well as good bonding is provided between the, the subgrade and the asphalt by means of uh, slurry. It is good or right practice to construct the rigid payment concrete below uh, expected flood level with the uh, risk Okay, the next question is, is it good or right uh, practice to construct a rigid payment concrete um, below expected float level uh, with the reasoning that rigid payment is capable to save even in uh, submerged condition? Uh, rigid payment, concrete payments, um, uh, normally concrete payment has joints. So it depends on which concrete payment uh, you are uh, questioning. So if the concrete payment has uh, reinforcement, that means uh, reinforced payment concrete, then normally it cannot be exposed to the water. There are main, uh, uh, many reasons for that, including the corrosion. Uh, but if the payment is purely concrete, so concrete always have the joints. So what happened in New South, it's absolutely a practical question. And it, it was an issue for New South Wales in Australia. So what happened was um, they have concrete payments with this joints because it expands during the you know, temperature change. So you cannot have the India payment with concrete. So they usually construct with joints and in between water get into the payment or water came from uh, bottom up. That means from the base to the top and that create the pumping effect. That means it created more failure when water get into the concrete payment, right? Um, so concrete payment, with joints, it's not a solution for the flood uh, a flooding area. So it's not a flood resilient payment. And we have already identified issues with this concrete payment. 
the next question is uh, in a cell for rigid payment there is a specification as pi value uh, i guess pi means plasticity index uh, less than 6 and uh, california bearing ratio 30 for sub base is there any allowable tolerance to select the safe quality material uh, since it is rare to find the source in most of the area can't we design the rigid payment with the widely available sub-base material as PI? Um, yeah, PI and the subgrade CBR, we also have a design guide. I haven't touched on the concrete payment uh, material here, but it, it has a detailed design procedure. So what I can do is I can share the details in a separate due to the time limitation. and I don't want to give too, too long answer to this question, and it cannot be a direct answer. So I will share the documents with you, the concrete payment design guide, as well as uh, answering this question separately. If you publish the event like this, website, you understand the power of research and yeah, okay. I don't think there is any um, specific uh, question on the research topic. Uh, I now uh, hand over this session back to Subhaka uh, for the next presentation, please. Thank you very much, all of your questions. It's motivating and also I highly appreciate uh, your long stay during these uh, difficult times. Uh, I understand. Uh, then, uh, we shall move to the next presentation of uh, 